Rivers provide a reliable source of water for drinking, recreation, and agriculture. Unfortunately, our careless use of the rivers has created some serious consequences for the countless wild creatures that live in the river and depend on it for their survival. And rather than going into detail about all of the environmental impacts that we humans have on river systems, I'd like to take a different approach by focusing on a seemingly harmless act such as walking in the river. Because when you walk in a river, your feet might get wet. But there's so much more that happens that you haven't thought of yet. Your footsteps disturb the rocks and the sediment along the bottom of the river, sending up clouds of debris into the water. And hiding beneath the rocks and in the spaces in between the rocks are countless tiny creatures that call this place home. And now, you've just turned their world upside down. These black-nosed dace know that a disturbance on the substrate means that there might be food in the water, and I swear they can hear the rocks banging against each other as I walk, and for these hungry little fish, it's like ringing the dinner bell. So they all swim over to where I'm walking in order to find and eat anything that my footsteps may have exposed. And they're not shy by any means as they swim all around my feet looking for any food that they can find. Unfortunately, black-nosed dace scatter their eggs in these rocky parts of the river when they spawn, so as I walk, I could also be destroying some of their eggs. My walk in the river also affects another fish that lives here. This is a tessellated darter. These bottom-dwelling fish don't have a swim bladder, which means that they're unable to float like most other fish, so they get around by darting from one place to another in a series of short hops. The tessellated darter can grow to a length of a little over four inches, and they're usually found near moving water. They have a diet that includes small worms, crustaceans, aquatic insects, and their larvae. And they're probably my favorite fish in this river, but the best time to look for them is in the spring when they're spawning because that's when the males really put on a show. When the temperature in the river climbs above 55 degrees Fahrenheit, these fish will begin to spawn. The males use their tail fins to excavate a small cave underneath a rock or a log where the female will lay her eggs on the roof of the cave. After spawning, the female leaves the cave and the male tends to the eggs, keeping them clean and fanning them with his fins until they hatch. But perhaps most importantly, the male stands guard to protect the eggs from nest robbers like these black-nosed days. I've been observing and filming these fish for a couple years now, and I have some amazing footage, so you can expect a full-length video devoted just to them in the near future. Another interesting animal that lives here amongst the rocks is the crayfish. These freshwater relatives of the lobster are nocturnal and spend most of their daylight hours hiding underneath rocks. But my walk in the river has brought some of them out of hiding and into the light. This particular species is called the virile crayfish, and it reaches a length of just over five inches. It's not native to this part of the country, and many experts believe that its introduction has been disruptive to the local ecosystem.
These invasive crayfish were probably introduced into this river by fishermen who sometimes use live crayfish as bait. Unfortunately, many well-meaning anglers release their unused bait into the river at the end of the day. And this is what's known as a bait bucket introduction, which is believed to be responsible for the establishment of many invasive species all across the globe. So, if you fish, please don't release your live bait into the water when you're done. Nonetheless, crayfish are scavengers that will eat just about anything, so they play an important role in this ecosystem by cleaning up dead and dying animals as well as plants. This crayfish is feeding on algae at the moment, and you can look forward to a full-length video devoted to these crazy crustaceans in the near future. And now it's time to look at an even more secretive creature that lives amongst these rocks at the bottom of this river. This little animal hiding in the rocks is a salamander, but it's not a fully aquatic salamander like the mud puppy, but the larval form of a terrestrial adult. I'm fairly certain that this is the aquatic larva of a northern two-lined salamander and they can remain in this larval phase for anywhere between one to three years. So at any one time, there may be several different age classes in the river at the same time. These salamanders mate in the water and then lay their eggs on the undersides of rocks. After mating, the female stays with the eggs and protects them until they hatch. These salamanders don't have any lungs, so on land they breathe through their skin. But in the water where there's less oxygen, the larvae have external gills that they use to extract oxygen from the water. These little salamanders are fairly helpless because they have no way to defend themselves, so they're an easy target for large fish, dragonfly larvae, crayfish, and wading birds. They're not very strong swimmers, so they're easily swept away by the current, but they survive in this hostile environment by staying hidden most of the time. But when I walk in the river and I move around on the rocks, there's a pretty good chance that I make their struggle for survival that much more difficult. And here's another creature that's affected by my walk in the river. And if you can't see it at the moment, it's because it doesn't want you to know it's there. It's the larva of a dragonfly, and these skillful predators rely on stealth and speed to catch their prey. They feed exclusively on small animals like fish, insect larvae, and even those cute little salamanders that we looked at earlier. These black-nosed dace that keep swimming by are a bit too big for this dragonfly to catch and eat, but the small ones are certainly on the menu. And while this dragonfly larva waits to catch a meal, it breathes by pumping water in and out of its anus, and if that wasn't strange enough, they can also forcefully squeeze water out of the anus to help propel themselves forward. So a dragonfly can use its anus like a jet engine to help it move through the water in short bursts. And if you look closely, you're about to see it in action. So when I start the video moving again, be sure to watch this area right in back of the dragonfly, and you'll be able to see the sand move as a jet of water is forced out of the dragonfly's anus. And I'll play this clip a few times to make sure you see it. All right, well that's not something that you get to see every day. Larger fish like trout and bass will happily eat these dragonfly larvae if they can find them. This dragonfly nymph might look very awkward and clumsy right now, but when they transform into their adult flying form, they will be one of the most skillful flying creatures on the planet. Some species of dragonflies can fly as fast as 40 miles per hour. They can fly forwards, backwards, and they can even fly upside down. 
Nonetheless, an adult dragonfly only lives for a few months, but the larval stage can last for several years, so most of a dragonfly's life is spent underwater. And here's another larval insect that's affected by my walk in the river. This is the larva of a fish fly, which is closely related to a similar looking creature called a heldramite, which is the larva of a dobson fly. Both heldramites and fish flies are carnivores that eat other aquatic insects as well as small fish, and they can deliver a very painful bite using those powerful pinchers at the front of the head. Both the helgramite and the fish fly are a favorite food of trout, so these larvae spend a lot of time hiding under rocks in order to avoid being eaten. And this is the larva of a caddisfly. These larval insects also spend most of their time hiding under rocks in order to avoid being eaten by trout. The caddisfly constructs a protective casing around itself using a wide variety of different materials collected from the stream bed. These cases are held together by silk and can be made up of little rocks and sand as well as wood and plant fragments. And each species constructs a different type of casing using different types of materials. Trout fishermen use caddisfly lures to catch trout, who will eat the aquatic larva as well as the flying adults. And, like many other aquatic insects, the adults are very short-lived, so most of their life is spent in the aquatic larval stage. Caddisfly nymphs are easily found by turning over rocks, and I'm hoping to one day find a caddisfly that constructs its protective case out of little flecks of gold. Here's another species of caddisfly that constructs its casing out of sand and small rocks, but there probably isn't any gold in there. And this little creature is the aquatic larva of an armored mayfly. They're very fast swimmers and the larval stage can last for up to two years, while some adult mayflies live for less than a day. In fact, in some species, the adults live for only about five minutes, which is just enough time to find a mate and reproduce. And here's another insect that spends most of its time underwater. This is the larva of the water penny beetle. They prefer swift-moving streams where they cling to the rocks and feed on algae and decaying organic matter. Their flattened shape is perfect for coping with the fast-moving water. Water pennies can be found on every continent except Alaska, and the presence of their larva in the river usually indicates good water quality. The adults are semi-aquatic and they look just like your typical beetle with six legs and a shiny black body. They live on land, but they can usually be found right near the body of water where they were born. And once again, this aquatic larval stage lasts much longer than the terrestrial adult stage, which seems to be fairly typical for most, if not all, aquatic insect larvae. Hiding under this rock is a leech, and it's not too happy with me right now because leeches don't like bright light. This is the head of the leech and this is the tail, and at both ends they have a suction cup that they use to attach to objects such as rocks, vegetation, or my ankles. Leeches use these suction cups to move by alternately attaching and detaching to objects using either the sucker at the front or the one at the back. This behavior is known as looping. And this species of leech carries its eggs in a cocoon that it keeps underneath its body. When the eggs hatch, the babies remain with the parent until it finds a suitable host, which in this case would have been me if I didn't find the leech before it found me. And if you look closely, you'll be able to see that this leech is carrying a bunch of babies, and these black-nosed dace are trying to get at the undersides of the leech so that they can eat the babies. The baby leeches will remain attached to the parent's body until they find a suitable host, then they'll detach and begin feeding on their own. Nonetheless, each species specializes in feeding on a specific host. 
Some feed on turtles, some feed on amphibians, while others feed exclusively on snails, mammals, or fish. And not all leeches are parasites that suck blood. Some are predators that catch and eat small animals whole. And leeches are remarkably stealthy because before they begin to feed, they release an anesthetic which prevents the host from feeling the leech's bite. Then, once it starts to feed, it releases an enzyme that stops the host's blood from clotting. They also release a chemical that causes the blood vessels to dilate, which makes the host release even more blood. As we've seen throughout this video, there are many different creatures, both aquatic and terrestrial, that depend on this river. And a simple walk in the water can change the lives of the creatures that live there. But most importantly, when you walk in the river, you change. Because spending time in nature, especially when you're near the water, has been scientifically proven to lower stress levels, ease our anxiety, and promote our overall well-being. So I encourage everyone to get outside in the natural world because it's good medicine for the body as well as the soul. But please be mindful of how important water is for our survival and treat our waterways and the creatures that depend on them with respect and even a bit of reverence. Because we need the river and the life that lives within it in order to survive more than they need us. And what happens in the water sends ripples throughout the rest of the world. Thanks for watching and have a beautiful day.